Hi, welcome. We have prepared a skit for you today. I'm going to just kind of set the scene here. We have Lisa, who's sitting in her office. Our skit is called A Day in the Life of a Superhero or a Children's Ministry Staff Person. So Miss Lisa up here is your ministry staff person. Our pastor is going to be Dominic. And then we have our friends, which will be Tori and Michael. And so we're going to go ahead and get started. So how are you doing? Say, I've got your mail here. Also, I wanted to remind you that we're going to talk about the upcoming ch kids program tomorrow night at the meeting. So be sure to bring all your good ideas. Oh, yes. Sure, Pastor. You know, I... Oh, I hear the phone ringing. Excuse me. I'll be right back. Hey, Lisa, you know that thing we were going to do for you? Yeah, the thing. Well, we're going to do it, but... N well, we were going to do it, but now we're not. Yeah, we changed our minds. Dude, we didn't change our minds. We just... It's not going to work out. Yeah, that's it. It's not going to work out. We have a conflict. Yeah, dude. A major... Conflict. Well, that's okay. I mean, if you really have a conflict, we can always make it another day. Uh, girl, I have a conflict that day, too. What day? The day you were going to change it to. Yeah, a major conflict for all those days. Oh, okay. Well, whatever. Yeah, sorry, girl. Oh, yeah, sure. Excuse me. Dude, she even has her helper help her. Answer the phone, Ring, dude. ring, ring. Ring, ring, ring. Dude, can I help you? Oh, yes, ma'am. She'll be right back. Just give me one moment. Yes, this is Lisa. May I help you? Hi, Lisa. I'm an anonymous parent, and I'm calling to make your life a little bit more difficult today. You know that event you have scheduled soon? Well, my child can't come on that day, and I was wondering if you'd mind changing the date of that event. Because if my child can't attend, then I don't think anybody else should be allowed to attend. Oh, and by the way, I signed up to volunteer this coming weekend. Well, I can't be there, so you better just find a replacement for me. Gotta go. Bye. Hello? Hello? Are you still there? Uh, she hung up. Uh. Dear Lord Jesus, you know that I am yours, and I want to follow you. And honestly, God, I would do this job even if there wasn't never a reward or positive feedback. But if you could give me just a little encouragement, just any, just some, it would be just, it would be really, it would be really help. Get me through this day. Amen. did a really good job at the youth party last night. I heard that they all went home alive, and that's always good. Also, I wanted to say that we really appreciate all you do here. You have such good ideas and such a willing spirit. It's a true blessing to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, just thank you. Anytime. Ring, ring, ring. Ring, ring, ring. Hello? Hi, Lisa. You know how you asked me a few weeks ago if I'd like to work with the children's program? Well, I've been praying about it for the past day or so, and I'd like to start working. I've already filled out my paperwork. Is there a time when I could start helping? Well, yeah, sure. This is great. I just so happens that someone else had to cancel for this coming weekend. Would you like to start then? I could mail you the lesson. Oh, don't bother. I'll just pick it up when I come by today and drop off my paperwork. 
Oh, that would be really great. Thanks. You're welcome, and thanks for all you do for the children. Bye. Goodbye. Hey, like, girl, you know that conflict we had? Yeah, dude. The manger conflict. It, like, disappeared. Yeah, dude, it was so cool. One minute, it was just there, and the next minute, it was just gone. It was like cosmic. Yeah, cosmic. It was a whole god thing, girl. So, like, we're free. You know any day you want. Yes, yeah, so. Yes, yeah, so just have your people call and like our people. Yeah, and we'll do lunch. Yeah, see ya. Thanks, Jesus. You really came through for me. Thank you. Dear Miss Lisa, I wanted to tell you something big. Last Saturday and Sabbath school, I asked, Jesus, I asked Jesus to be my Savior, and guess what? He said yes. Now one day when Jesus comes back, I will get to go to heaven. Thanks for teaching me that Jesus loves me. He is so big that he loves me lots. Thanks, Miss Lisa. I hope you like my letter. It's supposed to make you happy. Sincerely, Annie Murray. And of going to coffee, and we, Lisa, are you crying? Is everything okay? Lisa, this letter is supposed to make you happy, and, and you're crying. It made. Oh. It made me happy. God is really, really big. I think at a moment like this. God would say something like, well done, faith, good and faithful servant. Come on, let's go get that coffee. That's it, you can go back to your seat. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. Good to see you all. What's up, man? What's up, All right. Can you hear me okay? So before we get started, uh, <clears throat> we're, we're going to have a special music in a moment, but we wanted to take a minute uh, or a few minutes and have a, a special acknowledgement. Uh, we're going we're gonna to send out a family today as missionaries. We're going to send out a family today up as missionaries. Now, they're not going across the world, but they're going to be in a mission field. Make no mistake. And uh, our Rice is Jared, Jocelyn, and James. Would you please come up here? We want to take a minute. And so some weeks ago, of course, you all are you know, familiar with, you know, their story they've shared, but some weeks ago specifically, uh, Jared wrote out a very nice uh, testimony, which he shared with y'all about what God's done in their life. So they're going to be heading up to Keene. They're going to be teaching. Jocelyn's going to be teaching. And uh, James is going to be rolling with them. And then uh, Jared is actually going to be teaching as well up at the university, as well as managing uh, the uh, observatory there in Keene, which is super cool. One of the four in Texas 
Very cool. So that's, you know, seems like that would be a good field trip for some of our kids, just saying. All right, so we want to take a, take a couple minutes, and we want to just pray for you guys. And I know uh, I'm grateful for the chance to know you and to, have ex- to, to experience life with y'all and ministry with y'all. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again when you come back and visit every other weekend. And um, just kidding. But we will be seeing y'all. We will be seeing y'all. Yeah. <laughs> so we will be seeing y'all. But we want to pray for you, okay? Um, let's, say, let's say prayer. You know what? If anybody wants to come up and just lay a hand on them, come on up. Let's take a minute and do that. Come in, squeeze in, squeeze in. living God that we serve you are the ancient of days and Lord your faithfulness continues throughout all generations may we your people and your servants may we never forget it Lord we're sorry for our sins but we're so grateful for your faithfulness and how awesome that you are and and every single person in here has lived being the recipient of your blessings and your faithfulness Lord And some of us can think of very specific instances like the Rices can think of and have shared with their church family here with us about the ways in which you have blessed them, about the ways in which you have led them, about the the miraculous way, God, that you opened the door for them to go up there and that have opened multiple doors and have given them multiple affirmations that this is where you're leading them, Lord. Lord, there are many young people, though despite being in an area which is demographically very heavily Seventh-day Adventist, there are many people up there, Lord, who have not yet discovered Jesus Christ as their best friend and personal Savior. And Lord, you are sending these folks up there with a very specific mission in mind to, to lead and to point these young people to Jesus Christ. And we pray now as a church family, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would attend them, that you would give them success in this field in which you have called them to be laborers in, Lord, up there in Keene. May your spirit attend them, make straight their path, let them know that they are always welcome every time they want to come back and see us and check in and share a testimony of how God is working in their life up there, Lord. And be with baby James, may he grow strong in favor with God and men. And may he grow strong in the Lord and raise him up to be a great and mighty soul winner in these last days in the earth's history, Lord. Be with Jocelyn as she teaches and molds young minds and Jared as well, Lord. And uh, we know that you have brought them up there and that you are bringing them there for such a time as this, Lord. Be with them and may the spirit of the living God rest upon them in power and may they be blessed and walk in the favor of God, and may your face always shine upon them, and may they stay continually underneath the shadow of your wing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, as you're making your way back, I believe Elder Charles Christy has something for you guys. We want to say thank you, and we love you. All right. All right. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for being here, being present with us, Lord. We ask for your help, Lord, for your spirit to prepare us now, Lord, to learn from the word of God, to uh, accompany us 
and to rest upon us in this place, Lord. I pray that you use me, Lord, to be your mouthpiece today, Lord. I pray for forgiveness of my sins. And Lord, I give you thanks for doing everything that you're doing in this place, Lord. Please continue to do what you're doing and please continue to pour out your Holy Spirit in our lives. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, begin by sharing a story with you guys. And I think it's a pretty interesting story. It's a very uh, personal story, I'll tell you that, because it involves uh, my family, particularly my brother. Now, my brother Trey, and I got permission to share this story, my, my brother Trey is a pastor today. He pastors in a Kentucky, Tennessee conference. He's a very good pastor and a very good older brother. So love you, Trey. Shout out to you. Trey, years ago, his dream, his goal in life, when we were young, when we were teenagers, we weren't sprouting any wings, but especially the little brother, but Trey, when he was younger, his goal in life was to be an actor. And he wanted to go out and live that story of where you go out to California and get noticed waiting tables. where He wanted to live that dream of where you go out there and get noticed waiting tables. And so as he was in this phase, they they, they, word got out, I think they put it in a newspaper, that they were going to film a movie in Louisville, Kentucky, where, we were fr- where we're from. And, it's, and it's call- it was called The Insider. And this is a, this is a true story. This, the, the movie was based on a true story, and what I'm telling you is true. So The Insider came to Louisville to film this movie. And I believe it was, I saw the movie, but it's been years ago. I believe it was about a, uh, a whistleblower that worked for a tobacco company. And the whistleblower, that role, I believe, was played by the actor Russell Crowe, who was really big in the 90s and 2000s and you know, he's a well-known actor. And one of the other, the other main role in the movie was played, who played, I believe, the reporter who was going to, you know, kind of, you know, who was talking to the whistleblower. That guy, his role in the movie The Insider was played by Al Pacino. Now, I, I told my wife this. When I was young, I was an Al Pacino, like, fanatic. I watched all Al Pacino's movies and Robert De Niro's movies and all that stuff when I was younger. So Al Pacino came to Louisville, and they filmed this movie in Louisville. When, well, when word got out, they put it out in the newspaper that they needed stand-ins and that they needed extras. Now, a stand-in is somebody that you actually carry. You know where you at. You know probably all this stuff. Carrie Ann knows probably all this stuff. But like, so a stand-in, they, they, uh, they film the scene with the stand-in. So if you're Al Pacino... They're not going to have you stand there for an hour before you're seen and kind of just stand there and, and, and waste your time. That's what you have the stand-in for. They do that, and then they get the sound right and the lighting right and all that stuff with the stand-in. And then when they get the sound right and the lighting right and everything right, then they bring in, actually, the, act, the actor. Does that make sense? And so they do, that's a stand-in. Additionally, then they have extras. Now, the extra is somebody that actually is going to be in the movie. Now, you probably don't have a speaking part or anything like that, but you might be walking down the street or sitting in a coffee shop or whatever, and that's an extra. Well, word got out that they needed, that they needed a handful of people to be stand-ins and extras. So when that, I think that came out in the newspaper or something. So when that came out, there were 6,000 people that showed up to get 12 rolls. 6,000 people, Jason, showed up to, to get 12 roles, either as a stand-in or an extra. Well, some of you, if you've been in uh, acting before, you know that you have a business card. In business, you have a business card, but in acting, you have a different business card. But it's a business card. It's called your headshot. Now, the majority of those 6,000 people, they did not bring any headshots. They just showed up. You can imagine, hey, I want to be in the movie, right? My brother was smart enough to bring a headshot. So Big Brother Trey actually got hired to be one of those 12 out of 6,000 people. And I was an Al Pacino fanatic in those years. So like, 
you know, I mean, this was like, this was a big thing, and Trey really wanted to be an actor, so this was a, as well a double whammy, a huge big thing. And so Trey got hired to be the stand-in for Al Pacino. Isn't that incredible? Trey got hired to be the stand-in for Al Pacino. So, I mean, I remember watching this movie years ago, and, like, they would film a scene with Al Pacino in the movie, and Trey was like, hey, 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 you see that? They did that with me. Like, I walked out, and all those cameras were like that. They, they did, I did that. And then when they got it right, then they brought in Mr. Pacino. So it's pretty wild, pretty, very cool thing. And, again, Trey really wanted to be an actor, right? So this was just a very cool thing that happened, you know, we thought. And so, so Trey was a stand-in. Now, the thing is, the stand-ins are also often on standby. And so it's kind of a hurry-up-and-wait thing in that line of work where you, a lot of times you're just sitting around waiting to be tapped on the shoulder. And so the deal at the time, the gig was for 12 days, and it was 100 bucks a day. And th now you got to bear in mind, we didn't have cell phones at that time. Maybe they were out there, but they weren't common, especially among kids like you have them today. I remember when I was 17, I had a beeper, and it would go beep, 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 like that, and you know some mom or dad's beeping you. But this was really largely before cell phones. So Trey actually went up, and he asked the lady one day, hey, do I, do I, do I need to be here? Can I leave? And she gently reminded him, do you know how many people would, would love to be in your spot right now? Because remember, there was 6,000 people that showed up. And he just was like, got it, you know? But there came one night out of all those several nights. The deal was he was Al Pacino's stand-in, but you're also on standby in case they need an extra, who is actually someone that's going to be in the movie, right? Not a big part, but you're going to be on screen. And so he had to just stand around and, and, and be there, and, or if he was at home, you're on call. And so night after night went by, and the phone never rang, and the phone never rang. And meanwhile, all your friends are going out, and they're having fun, and they're going to parties and doing whatever they're doing. And there finally came one night, there finally came one night when Trey's friends, and I knew these guys, that they were having a barbecue, and Trey decided to go with them to the barbecue. And what do you think happened that night? The phone rang, and it was them calling him to see, to let them, let him know, hey, we need you to come be an extra in the movie. But he was at a barbecue. <laughs> and so when he got home, he checked his voicemail, and not on the cell phone, but actually on a physical answering machine. And he got that message. And you, you can imagine, and only I can imagine how, uh, I can only imagine how he must have felt in the sense of urgency with which he returned that phone call. He returned the phone call only to find out that they had just filled that role. That they had just filled that role. You know, when the opportunity of a lifetime comes, are we ready? Usually, there is a, there is a great deal of preparation that takes place beforehand. And when opportunity comes along, a very special life-changing opportunity... It's typically something that we've been prepared for and we're just waiting for. And when the opportunity comes, we're in a position to seize it. Now, today, we kind of can laugh about it and be like, man, that was wild. You know, he's a happy pastor today. His goal in life is not to go out to Hollywood and be an actor, right? Today, he's a pastor. It's just, but this is something that we can look back on and laugh and go, wow, man. And he told me he, this is his, you know, kind of, and he has stories like he got to briefly interact with Al Pacino and got to meet Russell Crowe and another famous actress from that movie. So it was a really wild time, right? But um, looking back, that's a powerful illustration of where for days, several days, just waiting for that phone call to ring, for that phone to ring. And the one night you, you say, you know what? All right, they're not going to call. I'm going to go out and go to a barbecue. And the phone rings, and you're not there to answer it. And that was the phone call. That was the important one that you were waiting for all that time. When the opportunity of a lifetime comes... Are we ready? Are we going to be ready for it? Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to find out and we're going to read about another opportunity of a lifetime. And some were ready for it and some, were, and some weren't. Some were ready for it and some weren't. This is in Matthew 25. We're going to start in verse 1. Matthew 25 and verse 1.
Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. This is Matthew 25, 1. Bless you. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. You know, we don't know when it's going to happen. We know that there are a lot of signs happening in the world today. And you know that you cannot listen to anybody who's, who can pick a day or really even a year. But we can well know from the Bible, Jesus wanted us to know what signs to look for to let us know that it was going to happen very soon, right? And we've talked a bit about that. Five of these young ladies in this story were ready, and five of them weren't when the opportunity came. Five of them that were there and were diligent and were faithful, and five of them weren't. Five of them decided to go to a barbecue, in other words. Not in this story. In this story, they all fell asleep, but five of them were ultimately prepared, and five of them were ultimately not prepared. So the context of this story, if you've got a Bible with red letters, this is a bunch of red letters for like a few pages. So Matthew 24 is a very big chapter on end-time events. The disciples actually asked Jesus, when is the temple going to be destroyed? Because he had said he'd prophesied that. And they said, when is this going to happen? And then when, is gonna, when are you going to come? When is going to be the end of the age? And Jesus, this is, that I know of, this is the longest recorded answer in Scripture. In Matthew 24, he goes on for a long time, specifically saying, this is what's going to happen in the last days right before Jesus comes, right before I come back, the, the Lord was saying. So then after he wraps that up, then he immediately goes into a number of parables, more than one parable, that are basically last day parables, eschatological parables. Eschatology is kind of like a study of, of last day events or, or things that had to do with end time events. So Jesus goes into these parables that are eschatological parables, right? And one of these parables that he goes into is talking about the ten virgins. Of course, what is the symbolism of the bridegroom coming in the story? What is the symbol? What, who does that represent? What does it represent? Jesus' second coming. So who is represented by the groom in the Bible? Jesus is represented by the groom in the Bible or the bridegroom. And who does the bride represent? The faithful waiting bride? Who does that represent in the Bible? That's right. It represents his faithful people, God's remnant church. As the Bible says, those who have the faith of Jesus and follow his commandments and follow the Ten Commandments. That's God's faithful bride. The bride is waiting for the groom. And so, in other words, we're today in the position of, of, of this waiting for the bridegroom to come in these last days in the earth's history. So this is the context of the story. Now, Jesus has launched into these uh, parables now, and this first parable is about the ten virgins. So don't miss this. Now, we're not going to spend the whole time talking just about this story because we could do a whole series on this story and all the implications of the midnight cry and all the different symbolism and the beautiful things that are in it. But today I really want you to pay particular notice to what the difference maker between the five virgins that were wise and the five foolish virgins was. I want you to t pay particular notice to that today as we talk a little bit about this. So in the Bible, what does oil symbolize? The Holy Spirit, and we can kind of see this in a couple different places, as a matter of fact, but it's very clear in the Bible. The Holy Spirit is not only symbolized by oil, but oil is one of the things that symbolizes the Holy Spirit, right? So remember when King David was anointed by the prophet Samuel. What did Samuel do to him? He went and found him at his father's house, and what did he, what did he pour on him? He poured oil on him. He anointed him, and that was a practice back then for kings and priests, and it was, it was a very special holy thing to be anointed with oil. 
So King David was anointed with oil from the prophet Samuel. And you can go back and read it. It's in 1 Samuel 16, 13, I believe. And you know what it says right after that, immediately after that? It says, from that day forward, the Holy Spirit came upon David. So you see the relationship there. The relationship between oil and the Holy Spirit. Oil in the Bible represents the Holy Spirit. So uh, even in James chapter 5, we get into the New Testament, James chapter 5, and it says, Let, if it, is there anyone among you sick? Let the elders come and anoint him. Right? So it doesn't just mean that some physical oil, an anointing, and I could share it with you, a powerful anointing story, but anointing is when you go and you, and you have a special prayer over someone. Often this is done by an elder or elders and the pastor, and you would anoint that person and you would anoint them with oil. And it's a special prayer that is involved in that, and the Holy Spirit is integral in that process that you're praying for the Holy Spirit to come upon that person in healing. So uh, oil is symbolizing of the is symbolizes the Holy Spirit. Excuse me. So oil symbolizes the Holy Spirit, right? And you see this in the Bible. So bear that in mind as we read this story. So pay particular attention to verses three and four. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So notice here that these virgins symbolize the people that are alive in the last days of the earth's history. That's today. That's today. And that's another sermon, but we could look at multiple instances. Because I know there's folks who have been hearing that we're in the last days for years, and I get that. But we could look at multiple biblical examples that illustrate conclusively that we are in the last days, right? So we're in the last days of the earth's history, and everybody that's alive at that time, these folks, the church, there will be some people that think that they're ready, and there will be some people that really are ready, and they're symbolized by these foolish and wise virgins. So, it, so everybody, notice in the, par in the story, in the parable, everybody had a lamp. Everybody had a lamp. It's not that some people had a lamp and some didn't. Everybody had a lamp. In other words, they looked a lot alike. If you'd have looked at all 10 of them, you'd have said, well, they, these have a lamp. they all have a lamp. They all looked kind of similar in that regard. But what was very different was some had enough oil and some did not bring a reserve of oil. So they looked alike, but they were not all alike. Verse 7, notice, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. So when you trimmed the wick in those days on those old-fashioned lamps, you were really kind of preparing that lamp. You were taking care of it. You were making sure it's not neglected. You were taking care of it just to make sure that it burned as bright as you could get it to burn and that it wasn't smoky or dim or something like that. So you'd trim the wick on the lamp. So everybody, both the wise and the foolish, all trimmed the wick. So they all want to shine as brightly as possible. They all want their lamp to be as bright as possible. Notice in verse 7, everybody did that. Now, again, we're not exploring this whole parable in depth into what everything different means. I want you to pay particular attention to the lamps, particularly not just the lamps, but the oil. What was in the lamps was the oil. Verse 8, and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. So what they're really saying here and what the, what the symbolism here is, give us some of your experience. So if the oil is the Holy Spirit, in the last days, there will be some folks who are wanting to get the experience or to borrow the experience, what God has done in the lives of those faithful who are faithfully walking with God and studying his word. And that there will be a lot of people in the last days who will say, I, I want what you got. I want what you got. But by the time that request is issued, the door of probation will be closed. The door to Noah's Ark will be closed by the time folks say, I want your character. I want your relationship with Jesus. In the parable, it is clear that there is a time when it will be too late for that. Now, the good news is that that time has not come yet. The good news is that time has not come yet. The door of the ark is open to anybody who would seek to walk through it still today. The door of the ark is open. So the door is open today for anybody who wants it to have a beautiful, special, precious walk with Jesus. It's available to anybody and everybody. 
it's available to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And Jesus specifically said that in the Sermon on the Mount, that they would be blessed. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said they would be blessed. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are going to be filled with righteousness. This is a beautiful thing. So, give us some of your experience is what they're really saying, what the parable is really ir- illustrating. But our relationship with Christ, our character, is not transferable. It's something that you cannot borrow from anyone else. It's something that you can't borrow from your grandma or your parents or your pastor or your elders or your siblings. There's nobody that's going to get into heaven based on someone else's graces. Nobody that's going to get into heaven in the end who's alive, who is who has neglected, let me put it that way, nobody who's alive in the last days who has neglected their walk with Jesus and put it off and put it off, and then at the very end says, you know what, I want what you got, can you just give me some of that? There's there's no spiritual equity that's going to be found like that. Does that make sense? So, verse 8, our relationship with Christ, our character is not transferable. So we know ultimately, we read the parable, that the bridegroom comes, but at this point, it's too late. He came while the others went off to buy oil, to try and find some oil. The difference was some of them had reserve oil. So notice that they all came in with a certain amount of oil. It's not like some of them showed up and had no oil. They showed up with some oil, but the difference is five of them had a reserve. Five of them had more than enough to get them through the night, and five of them maybe started out strong, but they didn't finish strong. This is kind of likened to the parable of the sower, where Jesus talked about a parable of a a sower who was sowing seeds, and some of them fell on the path, and some of them fell on good soil, some of them fell on the rocks, and they started out kind of strong, but they couldn't, they didn't develop roots. They weren't able to develop roots, and because they didn't develop roots, the sun came and scorched them. They started strong, but they did not finish strong. So this is a beautiful illustra- this is a beautiful thing because some folks in life we didn't start strong but there's still time to finish strong. And conversely the opposite is true that if you walked with the Lord when you were younger or you used to be more faithful than you are now or you used to not neglect your walk with Jesus but you do now there will be no spiritual equity. It's not like you're paying off a house and you get it paid off, and then you get to a point where you're like, sweet, we paid it off, now we just got the taxes, but we're pretty much good for the rest of our life. Spiritual equity does not like that. It's a daily walk. That's why Paul said, I die daily. But the beautiful thing is that the opposite is also true. If you didn't start out strong, you still have the chance to finish strong. So what was the difference maker in the story? What was the difference maker in the story? The bridegroom came for everybody, right? And everybody fell asleep. But what was the difference maker? Some had enough oil and some didn't. Some came and showed up with a reserve of oil. In other words, there will be a people who are alive in the last days who have a deep walk with Jesus Christ and it goes beyond the superficial. And there will be people who went through the motions and perhaps all their life went through the motions. But they never really got into the depth and their, into the deep things of God in their walk with Jesus Christ. That relationship, they were content to always let it be superficial. So there, there's this survival expert, and he's actually a retired Green Beret. <clears throat> His name's Michael Hawk. And actually, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he has a survival school here in Texas, actually. He wrote this book, by the way. Thank you, Lucinda. Hawk's Green Beret Survival Manual. So Green Berets, one of the things that they are foremost experts on is survival. They're taught and trained how to not just survive in other countries, but how to live in other countries. You can, they'll eat things, I mean, if you, uh, you could quote movies, I'd quote a movie here, you know, they, they get, they're trained to eat things that would make a billy goat puke, you know, there was a quote, famous quote in a famous movie about a Green Beret. You know, this is a part of their skill set, and they're very, very good at it. So Michael Hawk was one of these guys. He's retired today, and he does all sorts of consulting, and he even had a TV show, which I watched. You've heard of Bear Grylls, Man vs. Wild, probably maybe some of y'all have seen that. It's a survival show. Michael Hawk actually had a show, and it was called Man, Woman, Wild, where he would go into into wilderness and survival scenarios with his wife, 
who was, I believe she was British, and so just the contrast was so strong that she was out there with this British accent, and he was, you know, but they're married, and he would bring his wife into these survival scenarios. Matter of fact, on one of the shows, she even had got in trouble physically and had to be evac'd out of there, and I believe it's, it's on the episode. I saw it, but he's a survival expert, and I believe it was him that I heard say this, and he was talking about one of the biggest mistakes that people make, if not the biggest mistake that people make in survival scenarios. Do you know what it is? I, 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 prob- I would not have guessed this for me personally, but I believe it was him that I remembered saying this. Overconfidence. Overconfidence. And it makes sense because some people, like there was a book, and I, and, I, and I either read the book or I did the audio, but I believe it was called Into the Wild. And it's a true story about a young man who chose voluntarily to walk into the Alaskan wilderness. And he never walked out. He unfortunately, tragically in the, perished in the Alaskan wilderness. A lot of people think, they're like, well, I got this, you know. Don't be too overconfident. And I believe it was Michael Hawk who I heard giving this feedback, that he was saying one of the biggest problems, if not the biggest problem, for people that are in survival scenarios is overconfidence. For example, if you imagine... When you're in the wilderness, one of the best things that you could do is get a fire going. One of the, what are the benefits to, to making a fire? Imagine you're, you're lost or you're a plane crash, and you are in the middle of the northern woods. You're up in Canada or something like that, or Montana, but you're out in the middle of nowhere. You have no idea, right? What are the benefits of, make, of being able to make a good fire? Heat, light. What else, Jerry? You can cook. What else? You can purify water. What else? Signal, did you say signal? Signal with that? I didn't even think of that. How about scaring away large predatory animals? With protection, absolutely, protection. How about this? We didn't think about this. A lot of us don't, but it's good for morale. Because imagine, thank you, Declan. Imagine if you are in the woods and you're lost and it's nighttime and it's dark and you're scary and you're scared. It's everything is scary. Like you're, you're looking around and you're like, you're in this situation, not of your own volition. Or let's say that you hike into the woods, but then you get lost. If you can build a good fire, and before long you start getting warm, you start being able to, to see and look around you, and you start thinking, okay, all right, which way is north? Okay, you start thinking, you start thinking in terms of solutions instead of problems. A fire is good for many things. What Michael Hawk addressed, though, was most people make a tactical error, and they're overconfident in the amount of firewood that they're going to need to keep that fire going. So what most people do is they make a, a pile of, of fire. Maybe you can find some trees and you can chop some logs, and you make, that, you make a pile of wood. What Michael Hawk counseled was this. He said, get as much, get a pile of firewood, get as much firewood as you think you could possibly use. When you look at that pile and, you, and, and you're like, I, I, there's no way that I'm going to use all that wood. I'm not going to need all that wood. When you have that amount of wood in front of you, double it. When you get as much, pile, as much firewood as you think you could possibly need, more than you think you're going to use, I can't use all this wood, double it. Most people, he said, their problem when they go into survival scenarios is overconfidence. And he specifically cited that analogy of people are overconfident and they don't make enough firewood. When in reality, something like a fire, which is so basic and so necessary for survival in those scenarios, the difference maker often is simply a lack of firewood. Some people have enough, and some people don't. Some people have enough wood that they have a reserve to get them through the night. And some people don't have enough firewood. And what you don't want to be in is a situation where it's now 3 a.m., and it's really, really cold and dark, and now your fire is going out, and yet you have not brought enough firewood into the situation. You want to have more than enough wood that you have enough even in reserve. So if we know in this story that oil symbolizes the Holy Spirit, and we see the tragic end that half of these ten virgins, five young virgins, were excluded from the party. Five of them made it in and five of them didn't. And the difference maker in the story is who had enough of the Holy Spirit. Who had the Holy Spirit in the end? Those are the ones who made it in. Who didn't in the end? Those are the ones who made it out. 
So I want to share a few questions today and cover a few things that the Bible can give us counsel because I think a normal and very fair question would be, well, how do I know that I have it? If this is going to make the difference between going to heaven and not going to heaven, how do I know if I have the Holy Spirit or if I don't? I think that's a fair question, and we're going to address that question right now. So <clears throat> that's the first thing that I want to say is, how do you know if you have the Holy Spirit? This question is really akin to how do I know if I'm saved? How do I know if I'm going to heaven when Jesus comes? I've, I've had a preacher friend of mine ask me this question years ago, and it's a great gut check question to ask. If Jesus comes today, is he coming for you? Let's go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Matthew chapter 7, we'll start in verse 21. How do you know if you have the Holy Spirit? Matthew chapter 7. And I want to share two things out of the Bible, two things out of the Bible that are good indicators, that are the indicators that will let you know and be a very good indication and an accurate indication. If you have Jesus in your heart, how does God live in us? We want Jesus to come live in us. Physically, Jesus is currently in the most holy place in heaven. But God lives in us through his spirit, through the spirit of the living God. So Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you, pra you who practice lawlessness. Some translations say you doers of iniquity. Lawlessness, by the way, it's worthy to note they were lawless. In other words, they didn't keep the law. Well, whose law? God's law. But we know that we don't believe in legalism. You don't go to heaven based on doing a set of activities. They were lawless because why? What does it say in the text? What did Jesus say? Depart from me because I never, what? Knew you. It all goes back to relationship with Christ. One preacher put it this way. Of whom do you love to think and of whom do you love to speak? This is a really good indicator and a good gut check. So in other words, this is the first test biblically right here. It's a good indication of, well, is Jesus, do I have Jesus in my heart? You know, a lot of people, it's very possible. This is not coming from me. A lot of people think that they're walking with the Lord. A lot of people think that they have Jesus in their heart but they don't. And I'm not being critical. I'm sharing. I'm, and I'm certainly not trying to be. I'm sharing what's in this text. <clears throat> a lot of people, Jesus says it. It's red letters in my Bible. Jesus says many. Hold on. Let me confirm this for you. Many. Verse 22. It didn't say there will be a couple. It says many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? In other words, Lord, Lord, I've done lots of amazing things. Maybe I've, I have a wonderful church pedigree, a wonderful Seventh-day Adventist pedigree going back for generations. I've given X amount of dollars. I've, done X, I've given X amount of time. I've done all these wonderful things, and yet Jesus says, I never knew you. And that word here, know, is a really interesting verb. You know, we're kind of, in some respects, the English language is super cool, but in some respects, it's very limiting. Because, you know, I love certain foods. I, I mean, all, like all my life, I've loved pizza. But, but I also love my wife. Now, you see the disparity there? You see that? That's a big disparity, right? But, you know, in the Greek language, in the Bible, they have di several different words for love. They have phileo, which is like, that's re what is Philadelphia? The city of brotherly love, right? Phileo is a brotherly love. I have phileo for my brother, Right? Then they also have eros, which is a deep love. That would be like, you know, closer to husband and wife type of love, right? Then they have agape love, right, which is super deep. That's the depth of the love. Like God has agape love for us. It's unconditional love. So you see they have nuances. They probably have a pizza love word and then a wife love word, right? See what I'm saying? In English, we're just like, I love pizza. I love that movie, and I love you, right? And you're like, well, this is a different, right? But that's the way we have it. In this language, in the original language that this was written in, this was written in Greek. And the word here for no wasn't just no. Jesus doesn't just say, I never knew you. 
Well, I know my neighbors. I know my neighbors. I can tell you a bunch. They have several kids, but I can tell you at least the parents' names and some of the kids. I know them. Jesus isn't saying, I need to know you like, I, like you know, prob- probably know some of your neighbors. The word here is a word called gnosko. And that word gnosko is the way that Adam knew Eve as a husband and a wife. The word gnosko is the level of intimate knowledge that the closest earthly, earthly relationships you have between two spouses, the way that you know your spouse, that's what it's saying here. That's what Jesus is saying here. Depart from me because I do not gnosko you. I, I don't have a relationship with you. I don't know you. We don't have this depth of relationship. Does this make sense? So Jesus is saying here, it's all about who you know. And the most important thing in life is knowing Jesus as your personal Savior. And not just at a superficial level, but really walking with him. We talked last week a story of me laminating this this handle of this axe. And I tried to do it fast, and as a result, the lacquer never seeped into the wood. It never got saturated. It was only at a surface level. And every time I picked it up, it would come off on my hands. So what Jesus says here is, I never knew you. So the first thing is this. How do you know if you have the Holy Spirit? Well, as one preacher put it, of whom do you love to speak? Of whom do you love to think? In other words, do you have a burden for God's glory? These are some gut check questions for all of us. Is God, do you have a zeal for God's glory? Do you have a burden for God's name? Do you, you know, King David, many of the battles that he fought and much of what he did in his life, was it wasn't just to be a valiant king or to be a brave warrior. He was zealous for God's glory. He wanted people to know that there was a God in Israel. He wanted people to know that there was no salvation in the gods that they served, but in the God that he served. So what is the first indication here? How do you know if you have the Holy Spirit? Do you know God? And we could unpack this a little bit. Do you know God? Do you have a burden to know God? Do you love God? This is really what it boils down to. It's not a textbook knowledge. It's a love relationship. It is a deep, close, intimate relationship with God. Of whom do you love to speak? Of whom do you love to think? That's the first thing that I want to share with you. And it's found right here in Matthew, in this, in this chapter right here in, uh, in Matthew. Now let's go now for the second indication. This is in Matthew. Um, right now we're going to go to um, Matthew 20, uh, 25. Matthew 25. 34 to 35. Matthew 25, 34 to 45. Thank you. Matthew 25, 34 to 45. Assuredly, I say to you, you know what? Give me a minute. We're going to we're gonna take a minute and pray. Preacher's going to say a little prayer here for a minute. You have some days where you feel like your, your, mouth, your mouth is full of marbles, right? The preacher's going to, let me pray for a second. Lord, we invite you into this time again. And I give you thanks, Lord, for being here. Thank you for using me at this time, Lord. I love you and I offer myself up to you, God. Thank you for what you're doing in all of our lives. And teach us now about your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, thank you. So, Matthew 25, 34 to 45. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come you, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. 
it's reassuring to know that that fire was not prepared for us. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. And I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So the first question that we can ask ourselves, we say, well, how do I know if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you love God? Do you know God? And do you have a burden for others? Do you have a burden for the well-being of others, particularly for their souls? There was a great number of people that Jesus is referen referencing here that are, they're, on the surface, they're wonderful church-going people, but they don't care about others. They don't care about feeding people. They don't care about clothing people. They don't care about visiting people in jail. They don't care about visiting people in their home. They are very self-centered. And I don't know about you, but I have often been guilty of being very self-centered. It's easy for me to get wrapped up in my own problems and my own concerns. And before I know it, it's all about me, 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 I, I, I. And we forget all about the concerns of other people. Jesus is saying here that this will be an evidence, this will be one of the evidences of those in the last days who come to him and who are not, who think they're going to be saved, but they're not, and part of the evidence is going to be, you never cared about the poor, you never cared about the sick, you never cared about the naked, the imprisoned, etc. You know, I'll tell you a quick story. I was driving in, down, I may have shared this story with you one, before, but I, I was driving in downtown San Antonio, uh, this would have been, you know, this was a while back. And before, you know, before I was here, I was driving down the street. There's a place down there called Haven for Hope, which is a really cool place. It's a big, you know, homeless infrastructure. I mean, it's a small city. And you go there, and I mean, it's, it's a, it is an infrastructure. It's a very legit big place. But you go down there, and there's a lot of different stuff that you're going to see going on in that area once you get that part of the city. And I remember driving down there one time, and I was making a delivery to Haven for Hope. Of some, I was delivering some stuff for some other people. And as I'm driving down the street, I'm talking to, uh, I'm talking to a, 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 my, my best bud, and I look over, and in the middle of the day, I mean like noon, downtown San Antonio, there is an older man, gentleman, walking down the street completely naked. And I'm on the phone, I'm like, uh, literally in the middle of talking, and I'm, man, you, you're not going to believe, man, there's this guy walking down the street, and, and, and he, I told him, he was completely naked, like the day he was born. And you know what? I was like, I mean, this is, you have to be very careful. And I want to tell you that, you know, you got to be careful, you know, who you interact with and things like that. You need to take precautions and use wisdom and that kind of thing. But I drove around. I was like, well, I'm going to get a cop. I'm going to go flag down a cop. And I did a U-turn and I pulled back around and I, and I saw this cop and I, and I waved at him. I didn't want to approach this gentleman. But I was like, I'll go get a cop. I'm not going to approach him, but I'll, I'm going to flag down a cop. And that may have been wisdom. But I went and I, I found this cop like within, you know, a minute. And I waved. And I was like, hey, there's a guy down the street. There's a guy on the street. He's naked. And um, so he's right down there. Make it right. You'll see him. You know, I pulled back around there. The cop beat me, and I pulled around behind the cop. There was already a lady there who was talking to that man on the sidewalk and who had covered him up in a blanket and was talking to him. You see, who was the hands and feet of Jesus? I'm not saying what I did was unwise, but I, I definitely took a big, fat mental note of what that lady did. She went and gave him a blanket, covered him up, and was there talking with him while he was covered by the time the police got there and by the time I got back around. You see, that's a, I'll tell you what, that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful spirit. And again, I, I, exercise, I tell everybody exercise caution and, you know, that kind of thing. But I noticed what that lady did. And I noticed what I didn't do. But Jesus issues a very stark warning for those that, that are going to be alive in the last days that, they never really cared about other people. And even if they, and, and I don't want to say that, it's a step further than that. They never had a burden for other people that moved them to action. So the first test in the Bible, do you love God? Do you know God? The second test, do you have a burden for others? Because if you are, if we, the Christian, those that are following Jesus Christ, who have given their life to Jesus Christ, you're going to have a, a burden, a sense of, I got to tell somebody, a sense of, 
brother, you're hungry and I know where the bakery is. You're starving and I just met the great baker. You're sick and I know the great physician. You're going to have a sense of that and it's going to move you to action. This is what we should be praying for is the Holy Spirit. This is what we should be praying for, is for the living God to send his Holy Spirit and to come down and to fill us up, to fill up our family, to fill up our houses, to fill up our spouses, to come down and be involved in our marriage. The presence of God is what we truly need. That is what we should be praying for. Lord, may my house be a place where your spirit and your angels love to tarry. Lord, come into my mind all day long. We should be just, Lord, I'm sorry I forgot about you for the last couple hours. I just want you to know I love you. You're up there. Live in me today, Lord. Help me. Just May I be your hands and feet. Anybody you want to put in my path, put them in my path. We should be praying constantly to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And God's people that are alive in the last days are going to be filled with the Spirit. Those that he's coming back for, they're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So those are two tests I wanted to share with you. So now imagine, perhaps you've done a gut check. I think it would only be fair to say, okay, well, let's say that if somebody doesn't have the Holy Spirit, how do we get the Holy Spirit? To me, this is a very important question. I want to share two things of how you don't get the Holy Spirit. You don't get the Holy Spirit by cramming for the exam. So in the story, in the parable of Christ, there was a number of people who tried to procure The Holy Spirit tried to get the oil at the last minute, and they couldn't do it. This is not an exam that you can cram for and pass. They showed up with some oil, but they did not have enough oil in reserve to get them through the night. This is something where you walk with Jesus. Now, there, and I have heard it said like this, there is always the thief on the cross experience. The thief on the cross didn't have a bunch of years to walk with Jesus. He didn't have a bunch of days to have daily devotionals. He walked with the Lord. He walked with the Lord for a short amount of time but he gave him his whole heart now i've heard it said that there is that story in the bible for us all to know that you can have a thief in the cross experience with christ and there's hope in that but i also heard it said that there's only one story there's only one story like that in the bible right so we shouldn't go into that thinking i'll just be a thief on the cross i'll just you know repent at the last minute right we don't want that this is not something we're going to get the holy spirit by cramming for this exam number two you cannot borrow the holy spirit from someone else there's no one else whose walk with god is going to be transferable to you you have to have your own experience with god and i have to have my own experience with god how do i get the holy spirit that's how not to get him how do i get the holy spirit well turn with me in your bibles to luke chapter 11 luke chapter 11 matthew mark luke Luke chapter 11, verses 9 to 13. How do I get the Holy Spirit? Luke chapter 11, verses 9 to 13. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, he will, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who who ask him? So we need to ask. We need to ask for the Holy Spirit. So do not think that God up in heaven wants us to to, to have to jump through a bunch of hoops and do a bunch of different things and live some sort of super holy life and be perfect in order to merit the reception of the Holy Spirit. What God wants us to do is to ask for the Holy Spirit. God wants to live in our lives. He wants to come down and fill us, but we have to ask. So the first thing that we need to do when we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to ask for God's Spirit to ask pray for it to pray for the holy spirit and let's go to acts chapter 2 to pray for the holy spirit 
Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then, then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So notice when they were in that house, what does it say about them? They were all in one, they were in one accord. So we're to ask for the Holy Spirit, we're to pray for the Holy Spirit, but notice that there's a particular power when we get in one accord. When we all get in one accord and we're all praying together for the same thing of one mind and spirit and in one accord praying together, there is a great and tremendous power in that. And that's how the early church was praying and asking for the Holy Spirit. They were doing it in one accord together. So the first thing, how do you get the Holy Spirit, is you have to ask. You have to pray for it. You have to ask for it, especially in one accord. Now, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. There's only three things that I'm going to share with you here. Three things on how to get the Holy Spirit. Luckily, praise the Lord, this is not a super deep formula requiring a bunch of different uh, parts. This is not a super deep formula requiring a bunch of different hoops that we need to jump through. There's a few things that we need to do to get the Holy Spirit. One of them is to ask And the next two you can read about right here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. In Acts chapter 2, we skip skip ahead. The Holy Spirit has been poured out on them, on the early church leaders, on the early apostles. In verse 38, then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what two things did you see here? What two things does it require? Repent and be and be baptized. This is what Peter said. You want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, repent and be baptized. Repentance in the Bible, what it really is, this word that, that, that is used to define repentance in the original language, what it really means in kind of layman's terms is a U-turn. You're living life one way. You're the Lord of your life. Your agenda is what drives you. You sit on the throne in your heart. What repentance is, is you're really doing a U-turn. And you're completely, it's a complete change. And it's a 180. And you're going the opposite way now. It's a U-turn. So repentance. By the way, if you've never repented in your life, that is a part of the process. And that is something that I think is probably not as popular today in many churches and in many massive massive churches and even in a lot of little churches but the message of christ and the message of john the baptist was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand so repentance is a part of it and finally to be baptized you know one thing that we talked about with the kids that we were studying with over at the school we talked about this with the kids over at the school was when you get baptized, you're going into that watery grave. And they know it. When I would ask them, all right, what do we call bat? When you get baptized, what is it? You, it's the watery. And they'll tell you, grave. They know it. Because you're going down and you're dying to the old self and you're resurrecting to new life. You're resurrecting to new life. Does that make sense? All right. Hey, Mike. So repent and be baptized. I want to share with you one final thing here. Well, and I want, to, I want to issue this reminder. Next week, next Saturday afternoon, we have a couple of young ladies that are going to be getting baptized. Charlotte and Zara are going to get baptized next Saturday afternoon after potluck in a nearby river. Location to be announced next week. We'll give the directions and everything like that. And we'll try to make sure that that's put on Facebook. But next Saturday afternoon after potluck in a nearby river, Charlotte and Zara Spiritu are going to be getting baptized. We've been doing Bible studies at the school for a while um, in both of their classes with the help of Miss Nevis. And uh, so make sure and come out and support them for that. But repent and be baptized. I want to share with you here one, one last uh, text here, but it's a really powerful text. What we need to be praying for is the Holy Spirit. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. In Ephesians, chapter 1. It talks about the Holy Spirit. Now remember, 
who is the groom? Who is the groom? Jesus Christ is the groom or bridegroom. Who is the bride? The church, his church that he's coming back for. Who's the Holy Spirit? We're going to find out. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is, a, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee, some, some translations might say the earnest or the deposit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So God's people have been given a guarantee by God himself. And that works like a deposit. And we have that deposit to show us that we are entitled to heaven when Jesus comes back. Does that make sense? And that deposit is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the deposit. Now check this out. In the original language in which this was written, the word for Holy Spirit was not deposit. It was not guarantee. The original word that was written, that was used here, was arobon. It's actually pronounced arabon, arabon, in the original language. Not that I'm a language scholar, but that's the pronunciation of it. Do you know what that word, it was used to describe a word or to define guarantee or um, deposit, but do you know what it was also used to define? Arabon, the Holy Spirit, was also used to define a wedding ring, a wedding ring. Isn't that a beautiful illustration? Imagine that God is the, is the groom and the church is the bride. And the Bible now describes the Holy Spirit as being the wedding ring. Isn't that a beautiful illustration? What we should be praying for in our lives today is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What we should be praying today is for God's Spirit for God himself to come and live in our hearts and live in our minds and fill our lives with his spirit. That's the wedding ring. So we're going to have a closing song in a moment, then I'll come up and do the benediction. But I want to leave you with this to think about this. While we're singing, pray that the Lord fills you with his Holy Spirit and that when he comes back, that you are among the wise because you have been filled with, with the Holy Spirit, with more than enough saturation to get you through the night. Lord, we pray to be remembered when you come back, Lord. We pray to be faithful with the time that we're given right now to spiritually prepare for your second coming, Lord. We give you thanks for all your goodness, and we give you thanks that the bridegroom has not arrived yet, Lord, that there's still time to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that there's still time to seek your face on a daily basis, Lord. When you come back, Lord, may we be found faithful, and may we hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and may we enter into the joy of our salvation, Lord, the joy of our inheritance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.